And um, Jeff Lawton, can you tell us um, about him and as a teacher? Jeff Lawton, who's he? I've never heard of him. I'd hate to recommend him because uh, as I don't know him, he could be a bastard, you know. Um, <laughs> how embarrassing for you. <laughs> Uh, no, I'll use that bit. <laughs> no, no, he's a good mate of mine and uh, has been from early on. I always thought he was a good student and uh, he turned himself into an excellent teacher. Yeah. Okay. Not, not better than me, but possibly very little short of being as good as me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd always been interested in some degree of self-sufficiency. Organic farming always seemed to make sense to me and, and natural elements and hunting and fishing were always things I did from very young. And, and so that whole He's idea... A good fisherman. Yeah, that whole idea of looking after yourself in a natural way and looking after the environment was close to me. And then I was always concerned and, but never had any access in England. And when I emigrated to Australia, this word had just started to really start to buzz and become popular and, and I, I got involved, saw an advert in Grassroots, uh, uh, an alternative magazine and, and just signed up for the course. I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for at all. <laughs> that, that was a very early course, wasn't it? Uh, September 83, yeah. yeah. And, and what influence did Bill have on you when you did, did the course? Once I get my claws, you know, I haven't got much choice. <laughs> I was, I was actually a little bit sceptical, actually, at, at, at once at the initial stage. I, I wasn't sure about too much. I thought it was uh, quite radical, and I questioned that Bill could actually um, re have that much information to share. I, uh, but I was proven wrong, and I don't like uh, feeling guilty about uh, having the wrong sort of. Uh, thoughts about people go ahead feel guilty well I did <laughs> when I realized that I checked you up I thought I, yeah. s I see what whether it's all it sounded so radical and I, I checked the facts and figures and I was proven wrong every time and I thought I better listen really carefully to what this guy's saying he went and got his notebook back from where he'd thrown it away you know yeah well I actually thought I'd better take notes now I better listen carefully even if it sounds really, really <laughs> radical, and well, I learnt later that Bill has armories of improbable truths, yeah, which I shock do. people. I and, save them up, <laughs> and that works. So, what makes a good permaculture student? Do you think? Oh, I think somebody who really takes a lot of notes, thinks about it, challenges a lot of it, and uh, is willing to teach. I think they're the best, but. Most people don't teach. I suppose about two in a hundred would be good teachers. When Bill moved to Tyalgum and put in the food forest in the five acre site initially, I went to visit because it was much closer to where I was living, only three or four hours drive. And as I walked up the driveway, before I even got to the house, I felt like reprimanding myself for not putting in the same amount of rampancy and plant control systems. I realised straight away, I didn't even get to the house and I felt like kicking my own ass for not doing what I really wanted to do, what appeared to be too contentious. And I thought, no, I'm never going to compromise it. That was it. I'm never going to compromise again. People come staggering out of my garden, you know, sort of ripped about by thorns and stuff. And they come up to the house, I remember a woman coming up and saying, where's your garden, you know? <laughs> I said, you've been treading on it. <laughs> And they always carry a handful of ginger, because ginger forms on the surface. And they go along and they say, oh, somebody left their ginger here, and so they rip your ginger out. I think now, as, as times get more and more difficult, and, and, and you know, it sort of gets more and more stormy out there, we're like the only island that's worth landing on. And, and they're kind of circling us. And they're, and they're debating, and they're very close to shore now, and they're just about to surf a wave in and land on us, I think, and, and realise that we're actually central to everything that's going to happen in the future. And I was privileged to go working for the Cuban government on, on um, 
helping them with water harvesting issues. Everybody was back on horses and horse transport, and they're trodden around with uh, little back axles recycled out of cars, mm. with little differentials and little car seats on the top, and they're trodden along quite quick as transport systems. And uh, animals have all these wonderfully beneficial byproducts, and they reproduce themselves where cars don't. They have terrible byproducts, and they and they just cause a mess, and they don't reproduce themselves. You end up with a bigger problem. More what? the sound of the farts and the smell of the farts. There's a nice brown bum bobbing along in front of you. Burp, 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 burp. But yeah. what, what about our cities? What's going to happen to all these huge monoliths? Just a lot of farts. <laughs> no, seriously, come on. Oh, that's serious. I'm serious. I mean, the, the streets will fill up maybe the third floor with farts. Um, no, but they're going to be very strange habitats, some of those. Yeah, I so they're think, gonna mold well, me down into I back caves and myself, strange things. I, I I offered to rent uh, uh, a hotel in uh, in Texas because it was the sea was rising inside the basement and it they abandoned it. So see, obviously it's a crayfish farm. You turn them into crayfish farms? Yeah, of course I would. What about po overpopulation or population on the planet? What, how, will this stay Crayfish on? eat anything. <laughs> Is crayfish, this? think crayfish. Crayfish will eat people. <laughs> oh, but definitely. <laughs> I did, I'd, I'd like to say when I, I, when I was setting out and thinking I was gonna, I thought I'd better put a bit of effort into helping things and permaculture was uh, obviously what I, I'd intended to engage in as much as possible my whole life. I thought I'd better ask a few, I think carefully about some questions to ask Bill. I went down to see Bill down at, the, at Talgum and, and, and asked him two questions, two pretty quick questions. He gave me two quick answers. <laughs> I said, well, how do I know if I'm doing the right thing? And he said, if resources keep gathering around you, and a lot of them will be people, you're doing the right thing. So I'm like, right, I'll go away and think about that. I'm pretty sure that's a good answer. And I said, well, how do I know if I'm going to teach? And I, I think I can teach. I need the courage, but I'll get there. How do, I, scary how do I know if I'm, I'm, I'm a good teacher? He said, well, one, your students will do, will do what you're teaching. They'll become active, but particularly, you're going to have to produce teachers and you're going to have to produce at least one teacher within the first 350 to 400 students and then you're going to have to teach it, produce them quicker so i set out that's like that's my that's my target i set out for that i got one within 125 and they've been coming downhill ever since to about one every 50 or a bit less maybe but i'd like to think i'm on at least one every 50 now pretty quick they're into teaching and I, if I slow, if that starts slowing down too much, um, I'm going to let let the others take over, and I'll go home and keep farming. So Jeff's a better teacher than you are, Bill. No, I'm trying oh, to keep up with him. Nat naturally, <laughs> I think. Ask Jeff. He'll tell you he is. Jeff, are you a better teacher than Bill? No, and I never will be. <laughs> <laughs> Because, he's, because the longer you've been doing it, the more you have to teach. And the longer that you've been doing it, the longer you've been thinking about permaculture, and the more you realize you don't know about it. And no one's been thinking about it longer than Bill. And that's quite obvious when you, you listen to the lessons that Bill has to share. So Bill, Follow that through. I'm the person who knows least about it. So Bill, how much don't you know? Nearly all of it. More than anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now there's a, uh, a long way to go always, and, and new doors open and, and your vision changes, you know. Yeah, like nature presents accidental things to you, and you look at them and think, oh my God, why didn't I, you know, plan that? It was great, I did, they did it the other day, you know, to me. And, and there's some of the really exciting events yeah. in your day. Mm. <laughs> the puzzles that appear. <laughs> what an idiot I am. I, I've seen that before and didn't take any notice of it. I'm an idiot. And yeah. there's, 
so much more to learn, isn't there? Yeah, and it, almost the everything. Le learning is great. <laughs> uh, you know, when you learn something, you know, to increase your yields or something, suddenly doors open. It looks better. Uh, but but all you know about it is that there must be lots more doors shut. Mm. Lots of things you didn't take notice of. And there's still plenty of stuff to discover. You know, oh. every age thinks they've got it all figured out. Not true. Anyhow, we're doing all right for, you know, for a start. But as more people and more uh, intelligent people, we're not intelligent people, we're just a couple of rough types. And uh, more intelligent people get on the board. You know, things will speed up a lot. I call myself a rough ass mainframe designer. <laughs> <laughs> well, how's that? Because I can see mainframes, but the next few generations they'll see into the future of design. I can't do it. It'd be weird if I could. <laughs>